and it's going to cloud in case my internet connection is too <clears throat> strange. But otherwise, this is the API of Helsinki on 17th of November 2020, and we are starting to talk about API customers. And Alan, you are first. Take it away, and let's put our cameras and give a short presentation because there might be a few people who don't know who Alan is. Probably not, okay. but maybe a few. I think most people know me by now. <laughs> I would <laughs> hope so. All right, thanks guys. Um, yes, yeah, so so I'm Alan and uh, I'm going to be talking about, you know, how to create a great customer uh, and developer experience. So emphasis on both customer and developer uh, in my part. And that's here, we'll, we'll cover a little bit more detail on the developer part. Um, so I'll sort of gloss over that in this presentation. But uh, yeah, uh, so as Maya Jurka said, uh, in case anyone doesn't know me, I am Alan Knabe. Um, and I call myself an API product manager. I feel that reflects me as a person uh, uh, more so than an API dictator, as we've just discussed. Uh, so API product manager is kind of my role and uh, I'm co-founder of a company called API Able. .io since uh, this year uh, and we create uh, API portals as a service. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. Um, I started work after university in the year 2000. So I'm now at 20 years of experience, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and I've worked mainly for, you know, larger enterprises, you know, some financial guys, telecommunications, and, you know, also heavy industry. So I had a, you know, a, a diverse amount of customers and employers uh, during my time. So yeah, like we said, I was gonna talk to you a little bit about experiences, right? So let's delve into that. So in my world, you, you've got um, customer experiences um, and, and there's like user type based experiences as well. So uh, what do we mean by customer and what do we mean by user? Let's step into that briefly. Um, my, my favorite uh, quote for, for what is a customer comes from, from Ash and he says, okay, a customer is someone who pays for your product, a user does not, right? So I, I've said this many times, I keep saying it, uh, that's for me the differentiator to say, okay, um, who is the customer, right? And, and who is a user? So you can have a user of a system who is not necessarily the person paying for it. So if we, if we dive into that a little bit, um, what do we mean? Okay, so we've just said, you know, it's, it's the person who pays the bill is a customer, um, especially if you have like, you know, monetized APIs. Can also be that, you know, if your APIs are, for example, for free, maybe the strategic or something like that, um, it can be the decision maker is the, is the customer in this case. So whoever has the final word in saying, okay, um, yes, we're going to use this API, the decision maker, I call that person like also the, uh, the customer. So it could be, for example, it's an internal case and the decision maker is in another part of the organization. Um, and, and that's who we, we call the uh, customer. Um, and this person, you know, may pay for it or not. Um, and they may not even use the system at all. Um, they, they might just be there in the beginning to facilitate the, uh, the journey and then uh, they hand over to, to the user. Um, and, and quite a big one as well is that they sign legal contracts, especially in the case if you have, for example, IoT type APIs, um, you, you might want uh, to be signing some kind of contracts that allow people to have access to these devices and so on. So it, it's, it's normally uh, this like, you know, more customer role that, that takes care of that kind of stuff. On the flip side, you know, talking about user experience, um, pretty clear, right? The, the person who uses the system um, can belong to like a team of people. Um, and, and it can also be that they work for the decision maker. So the person who said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and you know, integrate uh, these different uh, use cases, journeys um, together, so, so that person. So it's kind of like from a very high level, the user experience, but what we're talking about today is really a subset of that, right? So say, okay, from the user experience perspective, we're, we're talking you know, predominantly about you know, developers and their experience. So that's where this DX comes from when we call it DX, it's developer experience. Um, 
so Natsi is going to talk more about this in, in, in detail. So I'm just going to sort of, you know, skim across it. But, you know, it's things like, you know, great developer documentation and having triad functionality, et cetera. So that, that's the kind of you now thing when we talk about developer experience uh, as opposed to like, you know, more of a customer experience. So what, what are those, you know, differences um, between the two, between a customer experience and a developer experience? Let's kind of dive into some cases. Well, the, the classic case is that your customer is a developer, right? This is the one that we've been thinking of for like the last eight years or so now. Um, developer is your customer. Right. And this is like, you know, absolutely classic case. Right. So you've got some developers and we all love those cases from, you know, you know, GitHub, Twilio, Stripe, et cetera. They do a fantastic job at, you know, talking to developers, knowing what they want um, and, and they really resonate with them. Um, and that's the one that we, you know, normally always quote when we talk about the, you know, developer portals, etc. Uh, this this works very well in organisations where, you know, your your customer has uh, DevOps. So my my previous previous company we had a big DevOps um, community, even to the point that the uh, developers had uh, credit cards and could, you know, purchase within a reasonable limit, uh, their own services and, you know, sign up to different APIs and whatever they needed to get the job done, right? So, so you know, in, in DevOps organizations can be that they're your, your customers directly. Uh, and in this, uh, you want to cut back a, a little bit on the, the marketing uh, hyperbole and go more into like the details. Natsi will talk more about this, this case. What about when the customer is your existing customer okay and what what do we mean by that and not forgetting you still need a developer experience even if you're pitching to you know your existing customers so if you're an organization that sells to um you know medium size organizations maybe fintechs or whatever then um you're still going to have a developer experience in there but when we say okay your customer is your customer um, what we're really essentially saying there is that you're going to resell APIs as products to your, your customer, right? So it's APIs, a product. You probably heard that expression a few times. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. But um, you've got customers and you're upselling them basically to digital products, right? These digital products have a clear value proposition in them. Um, they are consumable and they are monetizable. So, so these things basically allow us to, to reach your existing customers with, with new digital services. So if you have a strong sales team, you can effectively say, okay, well, hey guys, here's a new digital product. It's API as a product um, and we can like resell that stuff to, to your customer. And lastly, they're understandable by mere mortals, right? So, um, as opposed to like, you know, developers who are not mere mortals, we all know that we live developers, uh, they can understand like really like abstract things um, as we were discussing earlier. But um, on the business side of things, it needs to be more, you know, um, digestible. So flipping this on the head then, you know, I feel like a little bit confused now saying, okay, well, you know, is the developer my customer or not? Um, we, we, we've got a few things we can look at here. Um, one is that, if your APIs that you're exposing today require like a lengthy authorization process, right? So, so there's no quick tryout possible for a developer. So when you need like 15 people in the background to authorize it, you're creating service requests or like onboard this person. It's about getting them to like, you know, the assets of that they, uh, they own, et cetera. Um, when this kind of thing happens in the background, it, it's quite probable that, you know, a developer is, is not your customer, that there's some other persona there. So that's kind of like a trigger. Um, yeah, when you, again, when you have like, for example, the, the customer's assets, so like in, in the case of Connor, for example, if, if you've got um, a building like, I don't know, let's say, it's, let's say it's the Hilton hotel chain, right? And they've got, um, escalators and elevators and these elevators you want to open them up to robots for example then you're going to have to 
um, have contracts in place to say, okay, which elevators you're going to open up when and for which third parties? Is it for, uh, you know, Coty Pizza to be able to go in and deliver pizza directly to your end customer's hotel room, this kind of thing? And these kind of like contracts need to be signed up front before a developer can actually get access. So it, it's probably not a developer who's the customer in this case. And my favorite one is, is, when a developer has no choice but to use your API. So um, in a lot of the cases, um, when I've spoken to developers who, who are using, for example, at Swisscom, um, the APIs there, um, and I said, okay, what brought you to the portal? And they said, okay, my manager told me to come. So some product owner has basically said, um, okay, here's some user stories for the sprint. You need to go here and you need to use this API, right? So the, the developer has no like free will in using it. Uh, it was taken on a business decision somewhere higher up the food chain to say, okay, we're going to integrate these two, uh, two systems. And, you know, could even be at like CEO level that you have like partnering happen. Um, and then, yeah, it's a good sign at that point that, you know, you, you've got APIs that are not really for uh, developers as the customer. So again, to think a little bit about, um, about this um, and about, okay, who is your customer? You, you have to think a little bit about, you know, what your organization is trying to tell you. Is your organization trying to tell you, okay, we need to make more money, we need new revenue streams? Is it talking about, you know, partnering with partners? Uh, is the partner essentially your customer? Is it more of an internal story where you say, okay, you have a DevOps organization and you have, uh, you know, very skilled developers and you want to talk to them? Or is it um, within your organization, you don't have that many developers and you need to talk to different type of personas? So, so it's basically depending upon the organization and what the mission of that, that organization is, you need to think a little bit about that question, who is your customer? That's effectively what, what I'm trying to say here. Um, zombie squirrel, I mean, it's just perfect, isn't it? Uh, I, I like my zombies, as you all know. Um, and, you know, in this case, it's being beware of these zombie APIs, right? So there is a situation in where you, your, your experience is, is effectively zero, zero sum game here, uh, meaning that you, you, you have APIs, which are, you know, quite technical, but a developer can't really see the point in using it. Uh, on the flip side, you know, a business person comes and has a look at your API and they just cannot understand it. They don't understand what the value proposition is. You haven't done your API productization on it. Um, and and it, it kind of falls in the middle there. Uh, and no one can really pick it up and, and work out what the API is for. And eventually this thing is just gonna, you know, stagnate. You're not gonna get any customers for it. So you have to have a real, really clear understanding about who the customer is and think about the experience that you want that customer to, to have, be it developer or, or otherwise. So, so moving on then to, to, you know, from experiences then to, okay, the consumability and reusability of um, APIs. And uh, that's the whole point, right? So otherwise we just have, you know, old fashioned integration. So if, if you're doing, you know, point to point integration between two different systems, uh, we've all been there. Um, we know it's a pain. What we want to have is this reusable and consumable uh, APIs. Um, and that's where we want to get to. So one, one option of, uh, you know, exposing this stuff is you can have like a classic developer portal where you, you cater to the developers with documentation, et cetera. And then the other sort of pattern that, that's emerged is a digital marketplace. So uh, Apple um, kicked that off with like the App Store, for example. And now there's like, you know, millions of these marketplaces around. And uh, there's a reason for that. They, they make sense to, to certain types of people. So when the decision maker is non-technical, for example, um, if you look at Stripe and you go into the technical documentation, very near the beginning of that documentation, there's like a flag and says, okay, hello, are you a business person? click here, right? <laughs> it's like an escape button for, for those guys. It escapes them out to a marketplace um, where, where they, they're not bombarded with, this, bombarded with this technical information. So on the flip side, you know, if you have, you know, technical decision makers, if your APIs are real, really for developers, um, then you want to get them uh, into like a developer portal scenario. 
if you already have API products and you love your API products, you've got API product managers and you have a strong monetization case, et cetera, then you should be looking to use a marketplace. Uh, you can use a developer portal if your APIs are really clear. So, you know, if you can just stare at an API and it's like, you know, get banana, post orange, whatever it is, right? It's very clear to develop a, uh, very quickly how it works, then, then maybe you don't need so much uh, surrounding that you can get away with just the APIs. Um, yeah, again, when you wish to like monetize, you need this marketplace in order to check the people out, et cetera. If you can reach developers, then you can use a developer portal. So I, I've also seen many, um, well, mainly tech teams who create developer portals and then have absolutely no clue on how to reach developers, right? So running a hackathon. Yeah, sure, you can reach maybe like, you know, five long-term customers, uh, maybe if you're lucky, right? But having a plan in, in place on, you know, your developer is a customer, or how do we find those customers? How do we get them? Uh, what do they want, etc. cetera? Um, subscription type models, etc. cetera, use a marketplace for this. That's what they're designed for. And uh, also similar to reaching developers, if your IP APIs could be found as well, that's that's very important. Um, are you you're going to rely upon you know developers searching in Google, and then you're going to pop up uh, with your APIs to say, okay, this this is what we're trying to do. Are you doing any search engine optimization uh, on your developer portal? Will a developer ever find that stuff? Um, I mean, one one plus point on the marketplace is because you're describing the the value of your API as a product, it's much more likely that uh, Google is going to be able to understand what you're trying to say and, and then put it in front of people. If you have just very technical documentation, um, yeah, it, it's probably not what people are looking for uh, when they do a Google search. So you're, you're less likely to pop up. Should you use both? Well, that's kind of a question, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that you should be using uh, just developer portals or just marketplaces. Um, you know, you should probably be using both to some extent, right? You're always going to need a developer portal um, part to it in the background because ultimately a developer will be involved in consuming the APIs. We're not quite there yet with the whole no code, low code thing, right? Um, so developers are still definitely needed. You need to have that developer portal part. Um, and then if, if you know your customers are uh, very business-like, uh, you're going to need them to consume it with, with a marketplace, exactly the same way that Stripe does it. Probably, probably. OK. Um, so when we sat down and we talked about, OK, we, we produced this API uh, portal demo back in like you know springtime. And um, we said, okay, we, we want to think about this exact question of like, who is the customer uh, and understanding that there are multiple customer journeys going throughout the portal. So when you log in uh, and you'll see this for yourself soon, um, you're prompted to say, okay, what kind of, you know, customer journey would you like? What experience would you like? And you can say, okay, you know, the business person might say, okay, well, don't bombard me with technical details. I'm not going to understand them. I just need to understand the, the value it provides and then potentially, you know, pay with my credit card or invoice or whatever, and then invite in the developer. And the developer is saying effectively, you know, don't, you know, bombard me with marketing BS. I want to be able to see the API documentation, try it out, et cetera, right? Just to get access. And, and then maybe you have some of these, you know, really freaky guys who, who live in both worlds and they're like, you know, these biz dev guys, shall we call them? So you'll see that in, in a little while um, as well in the portal. But again, just to reiterate that, you know, I have said it before, but, you know, DX is vital in all cases. Um, I spoke to one guy in the US called Sam. He works for a fintech and his job as product manager was to find APIs out there that could enhance their, um, their own use cases. So, so make them better, decide which, which API out there is the right one to use for them in each given situations. Now, Sam's problem was that he's uh, not a technical person. So he's, he's more like, I don't know, economics type guy. And uh, a lot of these APIs are very, very technical. So he struggled a lot, right? 
Um, and then some of the, the APIs were a little bit more descriptive, a little bit more product oriented and he could understand them. But in both cases, he would always go to a developer before he did made the final decision. And he would say, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Developer, please check this API, how's it looking here? And if the API was bad, if, if the presentation was bad, you couldn't understand what they were trying to tell you. It didn't work when you tried it out, et cetera. They would walk away, right? So even if your customer is, is like, you know, more on the business side, you still, you can't get away with having a crappy uh, developer experience. It's still vitally important. So beans, my favorite topic, uh, how best to consume, right? I can't think of anything better to consume than beans, but you know, I am, you know, ex-British guy. so. Uh, I do like my beans, but um, talking about this consumability. So, you know, again, getting away from the old integration legacy days of, of you know, point to point integrations, et cetera. We want stuff that's reusable and consumable. And, and, and you know, really, how are you going to consume these APIs? APIs are products, right? So Heinz Baked Beans, one of the oldest products in the world. Uh, and, and here uh, we can basically just copy them and, and say, okay, what, you know, what can we learn from them and, and all these different products around the world from Apple, et cetera. What can we do to, to um, move forward? So um, it's a bit wordy here, but the, the one I wanna take out from here is our value proposition. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to say for our API, what's the value proposition? Why would you use this API? Now, if you're working internally in an organization, you might say, oh, the Flubadubba API, and it's very clear internally what that API does, but you, you expo expose it externally, no one has any clue, right? You need to like extract, okay, what the value proposition is and bring it forward, because there's no point in having an API portal if you have nothing cool to put on it, right? So you can have the best one in the world. I know some out there that look fantastic, but you kind of dig into them a little bit and the products they got on there are kind of like a bit meh. And I, you know, I reiterate as well, it's not just for externals, you know, this API products mentality is, is also great for like internal products, especially when you don't have a DevOps organization. If you have a DevOps organization, developers kind of talk to one another and they kind of work it out. Um, what's going on. Um, but when you don't have many developers in your organization, and there are still quite a lot of organizations like that, you need to present them with things they can understand, right? So you might have more of a business analyst, um, you know, project managers, these kind of roles that aren't so technical and you need to give them something they can understand. So they go, aha, I see what you're trying to do is this, make it consumable. Doesn't necessarily need to have a price tag attached to it. But um, you can, for example, have it so that the, the, you get like the project number and things like this, so you can book some time. And it's just some ideas that, that we have uh, around that. And one of the biggest things is that, you know, the, the product is a much better vehicle for um, delivering the value, right? So, so basically it's um, getting to the uh, customer, showing them, okay, this is the, the value of this thing and, and the product stays around. So you have a product team and they work on it and a product manager will continually make it better. Whereas a project kind of like runs for six months, nine months, or it's supposed to, but it probably runs for three years and is over budget and then dies horribly, hopefully. Um, and then someone's left holding the can, right? So some, some kind of integration team says, okay, well, who now owns this thing, right? And, and they have to kind of babysit it before it dies. So a product is much, much better a mechanism for delivering value. Um, and you should stop doing projects, do products instead. Uh, speaking to your customers and understand their, their pain is a vital point. Yeah, we're, we're a lot of us technical guys. We don't like talking to people, um, but you know, you want to have a good API product, you need to talk to customers and find out, okay, what are the problems? And then think about solving those problems with APIs. Uh, we talked about, you know, adding DX. Well, when is the right time to, you know, invite a developer into the um, equation? You know, don't invite the developer until the administrative work is done. Um, you, you don't want, you know, a developer to start a new sprint and then find, okay, oh, I don't have access yet. Um, he needs to also know um, which API. I, I recently browsed a catalog of a, a large Asian bank and they had 150 APIs. 
uh, and a developer going in there had absolutely no clue, okay, what, what to use when, right? So, you know, guiding the developer to say, okay, the business persona can say, okay, this is what we want to achieve and uh, these are the APIs. And yeah, also same on the security clearance as well to say you, you have like the full OAuth API keys, et cetera, up front. Um, let's have a quick look at the portal. Um, I think I have a little bit of time still, but uh, I'll, I'll just fast forward through this then. So, so there's the demo available that I'm going to show you now. So I won't dwell on that too much. It's technology agnostic, meaning you can throw whatever technology you want out of it. It's Apigee, Millsoft, Kong, Axway, IBM, uh, Microsoft, whatever you have, it can uh, run against that portal. You can implement any identity provider you have. So, for example, it could be you know Salesforce Identity, Azure Active Directory, whatever. We can integrate against that. Again, this role-based um, uh, accessibility that I'll show you in a second as well, and uh, also you know marketplace concept with subscriptions. So, let's have a quick look at this demo. Um, so here we are. This is one we did in the spring. So we've we've done a we've done some things after this as well that I'll show you quickly. But this is what I'm talking about being more of like a marketplace um, example. So so you can subscribe to them, have a look through. For example, this is like a mocked payments product. For example, and it says okay, it has a price, and you can see okay how many stars it has. You can see some features of it, etc. And you can subscribe or well, then you can see the documentation. If I log in quickly, you can see here that I'm using like an external identity provider. As I said, any IDP is, is absolutely fine. And then you present it. Okay, well, you know, please select a role. If you're a developer, you get a different experience at this point going forward. So you would see more, you know, technical stuff, the APIs directly to try out, et cetera. But if you're on the business side, we stay in this kind of more of a marketplace feel um, that you see here. So. I'm um, just going to go ahead and uh, activate this account. Yes. And so now we can subscribe to something. So we can go ahead and subscribe to this, this payments, for example. And I can say, I know it's like API ops, something like that, and say, okay, it's like an annual plan. So we're, we're subscribing, you know, in the way that a business persona might subscribe. And we can go ahead and have a look at that subscription. Here it is. So a developer might be more interested in this subscription part. Um, the business persona might change billing, credit cards, etc. But the developer is interested in, okay, what's the documentation? And uh, he wants to see the documentation just for this subscription, right? Which is what we have here. So he can go in and see, okay, we've got ourselves some documentation that he can then uh, try out or she can try out to see... Um, how this thing works. So that's it. So just to, to prove this works as well. So we, we have Kong running in the back end. So I can take this API key that was just, um, just done. If I go to Postman, uh, I can see I have this um, payment API up and running. So if you check the contract, you would see that um, allows you to have like an amount and ID. So the API key is missing at the moment. So I'm just gonna go ahead and paste that API key in that we just had. And if it works, dun, 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 dun. Oh, 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 <laughs> okay. It worked earlier, um, but yeah. Well, no, it's not working. That's the demo effect. Oh, there we go, now it works. Okay, you didn't see that before. Um, so now the, the, the payment was accepted. Basically, this is a, a mocked um, example. So it is bound to, to a, an API gateway in the background. I don't have much longer, I think, but just to say, okay, we're, we're working on like the next iteration of this, basically. Um, as you can see, it's React-based. And um, yeah, it, 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 it's quite similar. Um, the point is that you, you can go in and see a, a little bit more information now that you know you have uh, again you have some some features etc um, but you're also able to specify okay different plans so you can have like SME enterprise etc and uh, actually subscribe to a specific plan so again a bit similar to, to how it was before um, but this is all now within one Docker container so you can deploy these things you know either on premise or then we can host them for you. We have FAQs, etc. Um, 
so yeah, so then same again, you got your subscriptions with your API keys, et cetera. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. Uh, on, the, on the admin side, you can see, okay, you can create a new API product um, where you put your information on your APIs in, or you can edit like an existing one. You can change features. Features are bound also to then plans. It's very quick, but you can watch it again on the recording if you want to. But you can say, okay, you have additional plans and each plan has a different uh, price. The important thing is that per product, you can specify a different API gateway because you naughty boys and girls have a nasty habit of purchasing additional um, gateways, right? So API management. So, you know, I know for a fact that you've got IBM, plus MuleSoft or MuleSoft plus the APG and different lines of business, et cetera. So what we've effectively done here is made it possible to, to bind to all of your API gateways, but have externally for, uh, facing one experience for your end customer. So you can go ahead and add a new, new gateway there, different pages, and you can change the theme. We'll extend this to, to make it um, uh, different for you, right? So you can have your own logo, own color schemes, et cetera which you would expect, right? So this is kind of the iterations, very early days, but this is what we're working on at the moment. I'll just pop back into the presentation and finish this off. And yeah, so if you're interested in the API portal, of course you are, um, you can go to apiable.io. IO stands for uh, input output or then it's named after the moon. I'm not certain which one it is, but apiable.io. Um, and you can email me there, et cetera, right? So um, go ahead, you can book a demo on the site if you want to. It's a new website, new and improved, much faster than the old one, I have to say. Um, and that's pretty much me done. Thank you, Alan. And now, uh, while you are thinking of, of intelligent questions to ask, or any questions to ask from Alan. <laughs> yeah. So I will just uh, remind you about a couple of things. So uh, put your questions in the chat, or we are uh, we, we can also open mics here, but maybe it's easier if I just give you like uh, room to speak. But the video and any stories about this meetup and others and any APIs related info is going to be in the APIs.info um medium blog and there are actually some stories and videos about the latest meetups and also about some other events and discussions related to apops cycles method and apops in general and then the other thing i wanted to remind you is that if you haven't signed up already for the next api day Helsinki, or if you want to speak sponsor or in any way be of help and use in the API days Helsinki in March already, by the way, in, on March 15th and 16th, then do not hesitate to input your details into all kinds of forms on that site. So <clears throat> be quick. The best places are in an on online conference are going quickly. Uh, but anyway, so if you have any questions to Alan, I hope that you have already uh, thought about it. And, and Tuukka is actually asking the first question. So as a sole entrepreneur, where should I publish my API products and how? And that is actually an excellent question because that has been coming up a lot. And there are a few good and a few bad and a few somewhere between answers. But do you, Alan, want to take oh, Yes, well, some why not? Why not? Here? So... Um... I mean, so so you've got quite um, you've got a limited set of APIs. Um, I, I guess the the best place would be to to find the right marketplace for you, right? So if you search Google and find uh, there are even some you know marketplaces out there now for you know energy APIs, for example, I came across one the other day, and there's there's a lot of very generic. Um, marketplaces for, for APIs uh, where, where you can go ahead and put your um, APIs and, you know, lightly productize them. Um, and I would suggest to do that. 
Um, I mean, my product will be as a service. So you could in theory pay a monthly subscription and have your own API portal running, but it might be a bit overkill. It depends like, you know, what, what, what products they are and, and how much, you know, you can monetize them that, that it would actually pay for something. But I would say, okay, you know, look at an existing API marketplace and look to um, bring your APIs there, I would say. I would say that, that yes. And then I, in addition, there is that problem of a budget because a lot of those marketplaces actually do not allow publishing the APIs without paying a fee. And in some of them, the fee is quite steep, especially if you just want to kind of give people access to your API and you don't necessarily mean to first at least um, monetize it in any way or, or you're not sure if anybody is willing to pay. So it depends on the exactly like, are you wanting to monetize it and how much and how, how for how big audience? Or if it's just open data, or if it's just like a beta, or just your personal trying out of something. But there you have like less costly options, of course, like Netlify open, uh, um, gives some nice options to do that. It's not an API management solution, but works for many things uh, decently. And then Postman has that like postman collections and, and publishing them as a uh, like documentation and, and sort of a gateway. Uh, that might be something that you could look into. Um, but otherwise, the question is, if you are looking for API management solutions, or if you are looking for just a place to kind of uh, host your documentation because then if you are just looking for hosting documentation, then it's like GitHub or <laughs> something else. But if you are really looking for the API management capabilities, it's another, yeah. And Maria, is, I was going to go there. Programmable mm -hmm. web, yes and no. It used to be a very good place um, to get it kind of like published that you have an API and it still is a decent place for that. I don't know if anybody in the audience has, has actually any uh, personal experience of that, but Programmable Web was purchased by MuleSoft at the, some time ago, and, and, and they're, they are heavily monetizing that too. So it used to be very, very easy and cheap and free to get there. But if you actually want somebody to find you, then you have to pay some thousands of euros of money. So mm. this is the kind of question of what, what you want to do. But of course, there's also the option of hosting your own API management and there are open source tools for that. And then there's also like, I just want to kind of do a little bit of a commercial here. We have an event next Monday on a Hypertrace um, related, it's an open source pro product for observability, but it can be also used for like a level of API management, not exactly as, a, a traditional API management, but the level of API management. And um, that's something that is also some like like a, a potential option. But basically everything Alan said is, is totally true. <laughs> you should pick up the marketplace that works for your APIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your answers. Yes, I was definitely thinking of the monetization part yeah. And maybe yeah. it makes sense to try to find like or think of the paths of of a new entrepreneur with how to start and yes how to run the beta before the monetization phase something cheap and then how to then transfer to to something where to a platform that handles the, the payments and mm -hmm. yes yeah maybe first takes a percentage cut and then later you want to find something where it's uh, yeah, and and lower. yeah, exactly. And, and the, even if somebody does take a revenue share of your money, it doesn't matter as long as you don't even make any money, <laughs> if you get still exposure. But if you have to kind of pay somebody upfront a lot of money per month that you don't actually have that money yet, and you don't even know if somebody wants your API or not. So that's a question you should like prototype and get the audience attraction or something before you kind of put on a lot of money. 
But I guess uh, that's the kind of normal path to product management in, in terms of uh, any product that I've heard of. But hey, any other questions? This was an excellent question. Any easier questions? <laughs> or, I think hard ones as well, I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> It was a really great question. It's just that there is no like super easy on it. If there are no questions right now, then I would say that um, I have one question for the audience and then we might go forward. But how many in the audience have actually used an API management tool or platform ever? Say yes or I or some something in the chat. Okay. I think I think uh, it's possible to raise your hand as well. I don't know. Yeah, well, it is, but it's kind of like it works a little bit differently here. But okay, so. About, and, and of course, yes for me and yes for Alan, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, th I think that overall like, like half of the people have. And, and just to be sure that if you don't know what an API management is as a tool or technology, then, then that's something that you could take a look. And there are actually some discussions about it in the APIs info, but, but typically it's something that controls um, the traffic to the API on runtime, but also holds potentially the documentation and takes care of the subscriptions. So just in case, not everybody knows what it is. Okay, so then if there are no more questions for now, uh, I guess we are ready to go towards the, um, Nazi has talked about developer experience and, and her experiences on the um, how, how to develop and design that. Yeah. And while you are setting up your slides there, I'll just share the, the link to next week's uh, free event on hypertrace and observability and APIs related to that. So if you haven't signed up yet, there's your chance now in the chat. Nazia, are you ready? Yes, I am, but I think my video is frozen, so I'm not sure if, <laughs> if it is blocked or something. Uh, yeah, I think, let's see. No, it's not blocked, but there might be something weird. Okay, no, now it's, working, now yes. it's uh, working well, so possibly the video was yeah. blocked. So let me share my screen as well. Uh, And so Nazia comes from Platform of Trust, and I think I trust that you will let people know a little bit about what is Platform of Trust too. Yes, definitely <laughs> will be coming <laughs> coming as part of I tell my story. So hi everyone, um, thanks to Marioka that you gave us an invitation to talk over here. Um, I'm Nazia and I'm now working in Platform of Trust as head of design and then I focus my work on developer experience and API, API designing. So my thanks to Alan first for giving this insightful talk about what sort of marketplace or developer portal you should be offering based on your customer segment and that gives me an excellent time to chime in and then talk about making DX better with onboarding and resources. Um, my speaking is uh, today solely based on my experiences and learning that I gather in the past two years while working to create and execute developer experience in, in platform of trust. So being a student of user experience in my master's studies, I wanted to start with a simple quote to bring attention to the topic we are going to talk about um, that my my ideology is that API documentation is good when it comes to understanding and using APIs, but nothing beats developer guide for aiding to follow feature workflows. 
Um, why this realization? Let me start with a story. So our company platform of trust started its journey at the beginning of 2019. We began our mission to offer businesses a competitive age by utilizing their own data themselves to make smarter decisions and then to understand the unknown without worrying about time, effort, and the resource needed to conduct the integration projects. Um, as we are talking about integration, we had a hunch that our potential customers are going to be developers um, because nowadays the decisions to choose uh, any IT solution or any enterprise solution are heavily, uh, have heavily affluenced by them. And this is something which has been uh, reported in the enterprise uh, purchasing decisions. Uh, in the past view and developer 2019 summer executive summary released by International Data Corpor uh, Corporation. So developers were and still are one of the personas we will always aim to cater over here. Um, while designing our service, we had to consider the facts that uh, developers are no-nonsense people. Um, they won't be impressed with your advertising campaign unless you show them the value generated practically. They are busy people, so if your product or the underneath API, here I'm referring the API from business perspective as a product, uh, isn't showing them the way to solve their problem uh, in a simple and time efficient way, they will leave. And they can even do some rather drastic things is that they will find something open source, customize it or make something similar. So it is important for us to consider about the ease of onboarding and self-services when catering developer experiences. Um, so what was our initial strategy? Um, we started by offering them first to try out all our features in the, our platform in a sandbox for free. We gave them the playground to try out their integration projects or application development in a secured and isolated manner. And along with it came human-friendly API documentation with code samples for API endpoints and their methods. But still, there were some frictions from the developers to comprehend and use our offerings. Um, there was a way to onboard, but the path was not easy to follow. So based on our initial discoveries and then doing, talking with them, we figured out that we had two problems to tackle down. One is that how to make your onboarding simpler, faster, easier for new developers who are coming to our services, and then how to make the available resources more developer friendly. So the question asks, uh, asked previously aimed towards improving developer experience as Alan has already talked about the subset that the developer experience belongs into the user experience. So I will not uh, spend much time talking about this thing, but just a bit, uh, just a bit uh, heads up to people who might not be knowing this terminology now. The term developer experience nowadays has got more familiarity than it used to have even in 1.5 uh, years ago. Developer experience is an applied newer branch of user experience where you design your service by keeping the user segment developers in the center. So that from the beginning of the usage and during the usage and even after the users, usage has ends, Developers have a feeling of satisfaction that they achieved something to solve the problem that they are looking for. Um, it's just like any other uh, services that we provide to normal users that if your service is complicated to use, user will find some alternative to them. And it's even like dangerous to handle developers that if your service lacks clarity and hard to use, developers might build something on their own. So as we were talking about marketplaces or API portals or even developer portals based on the customer you are trying to achieve, all of them are always to ensure 
continuous and improved developer experiences. Depending on the solution that you are trying to implement as part of your service, your developer portal should aim to facilitate service onboarding and adoption, uh, adop adaptation for your developer uh, customers. Um, based on the offerings from your service, developers should be able to try it out and solve the problem they are looking for a solution. They, that might be a combination of a couple of hosted service, but nevertheless, a, uh, nevertheless as a total package uh, to cater developer experience. And that's uh, self-service is, is the place where it comes to offer you that. And supporting components there are that are common in developer portals or API portals are complete API documentation from the perspective of business model or technical details, which includes um, open API specification, tryout, code samples, uh, CI, CD integration to make changes to our API specs, and then they are deployed automatically, uh, status of your API, and then even API profiles so that the business users can grasp an idea that what uh, what part of service that API is uh, currently implementing or what part of the business value it is actually uh, providing the technical support of. Then about building the trust and uh, support from the community, uh, your, uh, your portal should be providing blogs, then use cases, frequently asked question, feedback, and even newsletters so that new uh, that the people who are subscribing them and then committing your time to your service to advocate you they get the sneak peeks of upcoming uh, exciting features that you are going to offer to your customers very soon and last but not the least it comes that your developer customers or developer personas should be able to onboard try out and understand your service in no less time so we about talking about supports in parallel uh, if you check some of the popular services like stripe github or twilo uh, you would see that uh, they put a lot of effort to provide good uh, customer experience or developer experience from api documentation so let's maybe take a look in the stripe documentation and possibly we go to the subscription api that they have now i don't know where did it go yeah there it is so if you take a look in the subscription api or the api documentation that stripe has that uh, they are actually presented as a business product rather than technical black boxes so stakeholders from any field domain can get a grasp of what is going on the documentation contents are more human readable than they what used to be previously. Adequate examples of uh, SDKs, code samples are provided there while explaining their functionalities of the endpoints. And then again, if we go back to Twilio. So you can see that uh, there are functionalities of the endpoints that there is code samples in PHP, Ruby, or whatever framework you are more habituated it while building your application so that you don't need to learn the uh, critical things about an API, but just start to do that thing. And then you can even try out them all from here. And as we were talking about programmable web, so just let's take a look over here. In the programmable web, it's more like a marketplace, in my opinion, that you can talk about your API and then produce it like an API profile, along with the summaries, the HDKs you are providing, and even like uh, other stuff that you can show about your API or what you are actually offering in here. Mm. While there are no doubt about the importance of good API documentation, we should question that uh, are the developers getting lost in the translation with the continuously going lists uh, of APIs and endpoints? Because as your service gets more maturity level, you might have complex APIs, even you might have even newer APIs. So the list always becomes longer and it's 
really not possible for a new up, a newcomer developer to learn everything on just by looking at the documentation. And can they aim to solve a particular problem using your service in less time? So like normal consumers, like us normal people, they will think about how I can use this service in no less time. So here, let's take a look in the API documentation again for Stripe. So what they're doing is that uh, they have a well-documented API, which has the functionality of associated objects, then the attributes, list of endpoints, sample code snippets in different framework for API requests and responses, and then link to external resources. And these are actually its strength. But however, for a developer who, the, who is new into Stripe, this might get complicated. If she, he or she is going to start using the service from the very beginning and ends up in the API documentation for balance, she or he will have no idea about uh, what it is. Uh, what is the balance is from business perspective or the services workflow perspective and where it does actually in, uh, impact in the overall workflow of Stripe. So the, uh, so the approach that they took is that provide um, link to documentation, let the, uh, let the GIF image actually come back at its, uh, at its uh, original place. But what they have done is that uh, while explaining the endpoints, the related functionality and the attribute list, they have provided a section which uh, talks about the business model or the business side that it implements. And then there is actually guides over here to understand and connect account balances on transactions. So these are approach taken to point a suitable developer guides to redirect the developers to learn more about the concept and their usage uh, before they actually can start using the API for specific functionality. So even from this practical example that API documentation is necessary, definitely there is no question about it, but may not be completely sufficient for referencing uh, an onboarding process. And then here comes about our, uh, again, our programmable web, where there is the YouTube API, a very popular uh, service. We don't, we don't need to talk about what YouTube is, but this is for, for more from the developer's perspective. And as programmable web is a newer uh, market, uh, is a well-known API marketplace, we can see that API profiles uh, hosting how to sections describing uh, workflows or process that how you can actually uh, use the daily motion API to leverage video search, uh, maybe an extended part uh, which uh, with which the API YouTube API facilitated some of the services, and then even some articles to learn about learn about the YouTube API before you are actually ju jumping into the uh, technical details from here. So when it comes about allowing third party developers to implement their apps or services with the help of API, it's uh, always good developer experience principle that uh, given them giving them an optimal workflow to follow the or of to follow it and to start using the service uh, provided by YouTube. And let's go back to our presentation. So in this context, we might ask that how developer guides can help. Uh, your services are running via interaction with different APIs and there is a documentation to describe the necessary calls, but how they work, what part of the business model it realizes in technical means and then how they can be used to try out your services. These can be demonstrated via developer guides. The choice of mediums can be many. Um, you can add a page via CMS containing the contents for the guide or create a video out of a PowerPoint presentation. If you want to make the impression, then if you uh, then why not make a tutorial in your sandbox environment with hints and feedbacks about possible actions or executing a certain 
workflow in your service or even with the current trend and with the COVID situation, why not try something at home and have a good experience with the, using the ARVR. If your technology, the uh, technology that you are offering supports it, then you should definitely go for it. And as I said, that how you actually guiding your uh, developer customers to get used to your service, the possibilities are endless. Um, here we will talk about what type of guides we might have in our developer portal. So two common types is um, onboarding guide, and then another one is exploratory guide. So how they are actually different from one another. Um, suppose your service has a core API providing some specific uh, feature of your service. Um, here, what normally an API profile describes its capabilities, then uh, sample calls, uh, related resources, and then even an API documentation listing all its endpoints supported method with needed parameters and code examples. Is this sufficient? Maybe. But what about familiarizing yourself with the feature from specs and learning how to uh, use it? What might be the different usage context or use cases you, uh, of this feature? And even how if that particular feature interacts with uh, other part of your uh, general workflow or even the other part of the interfaces of your service this, uh, of your service architecture. So general the API documentation usually doesn't have all much uh, all this much of details. So to resolve this dilemma, we can, uh, you can offer a guide that will actually demonstrate with simple steps and needed uh, API calls using a particular feature of your service from the scratch. Um, which can be like starting to make post calls to do some work and then get that results using your uh, HTTP GET request, or even trying to manipulate them with put and um, put and delete requests over there. And all, also in the guide, you can talk about external resources. There's, as for example, demo apps, then other other associated guides to use more advanced side of your API. So a lot of things can be in, incorporated in an exploratory guide, which will solely focus on one API and what's its functionality in terms of business and technological uh, stack. So here the workflow actually aims to make it better for new onboarding developers to understand the concept and try more advanced feature. And then comes about onboarding guides. Um, if I actually go back to our developer portal that we are hosting using uh, Wactel CMS, we have this uh, onboarding guide, which comprises of a simple step-by-step -step instruction to start utilizing your offered service in a, a very short time. Steps can consist of simple call request, which you can copy and then simply put into your uh, into, uh, into your um, command line or even your terminal to try to execute and see what your API is actually returning as an answer. Then in addition, you can also refer to other resources or exploratory guides that your developer portal or your API portal should, prov uh, should provide. Instead of sign up, or the pricing CTA, you can actually place such onboarding guides as the very first CTA so that the intention that you provide to your developers that you can start using our service in as fast as possible without drawing into technical jargons and complexities and you don't even need to uh, commit into something before you are actually deciding to purchase us or use our services. So the question might come that using these sort of resources like API documentation and then developer guides, are we targeting all developer segments? 
I may not represent the all the developer segments with my own justification, and there is no doubt that there are more, uh, how to say that, more talented developers exist out who can figure out a service overnight. But migrating from a UI design role, UI designing role towards ensuring flow state developer experience, my learning curve aided me to realize that how important it is to have um, simple onboarding for users like me who are somewhat in the middle ground of technical details and business requirements. And even for newbie developers who are often afraid to break things while experimenting. So, and even there are possibility that hardcore developers can be your target segments uh, audience as well, because it will save their much allocated time to try out something and maybe um, and maybe like uh, commit to commit themselves to your service. And even if they find that your service is having a bug or some hidden glitch, they will be the first one very much vocal to you to inform about them. And it also actually helps you to get customer feedback and then make continue to improve your service or make better, better uh, experience uh, to cater your developers. So some tricks and tips uh, that I have learned and continue to apply while designing re developer resources. So you should plan a workflow targeting specific developer segment that will aid them to start using your service in the earliest possible time. Learning can be achieved on the flow of trying out the service. Um, based on target developer segment, provide one or two onboarding guides or tutorial containing simple step-by-step -step instructions to execute the workflow. If your service provides interface for tryout via GUI, then provide the option or alternatively, as I demonstrated earlier, that you can provide simple call requests to your API, uh, to your APIs and they will just work fine. Um, when writing exploratory guides, describe the features and the working of APIs, trying to tell the story from customer perspective. What is the problem scenario? What they want to achieve? This is specifically for young developers starting their journey about the Postman collection, which is something a really good uh, tool, like any REST API clients like Insomnia Workspace or Postman, which actually gives people, uh, newbie developers, to try out your APIs without even opening a console or other stuff. Um, that would be actually a cherry on top for them to get familiarized with your APIs. And nowadays, REST API clients provide options to create single click execution, uh, executions of your service workflow. So these are worthy to invest your time and effort. And then last but not the least, quick feedback response cycle. This can be very simple, like have CTAs in your developer portal or, uh, or or the marketplace, which actually goes to GitHub and uh, GitHub issue template where the developers can actually write down their pain and you go back to them as uh, to APIs their pain with your provided solution and guidance. And in this case, you can your GitHub organization can dedicate a sole repository which will contain only issues which are coming from your developer portal or any other marketplaces where you are hosting your uh, uh, resources or developer, uh, developer documentation, whether it's API guides or onboarding guides or tools, anything. So um, coming to the concluding remarks, um, this is uh, my realization and my feeling that API documentation, no matter how well it is structured, reference or interactive, we are simply loving a solution by just relying on API documentation. And we are not loving the problem itself. And from the storytelling approach that we learned that we should always learn to love the problem, not the solution itself, because then we are actually confining our thinking in a simple box, but and we are not trying to uh, judge all other possibilities that might uh, arise in future. So in this tug of war of API documentation and developer guide, 
finding the middle way to loosen up the friction, maybe an optimal path for you to cater your developer personas and maybe make a better service for uh, your other user customers. Because as we say, the developers will be influencing the bigger business decisions to purchase your services. And I guess we still have like four minutes before my presentation time is over, but I think we can actually head straight towards discussion and questions. Yes, I think we can do exactly that. And, and while you are thinking of your questions in the audience, I just want to say that it has been really interesting to hear the presentation and, and uh, like I love the kind of design perspective yeah. to APIs and, and developer experience because oftentimes we don't see that because designers are staying far away <laughs> from stuff like APIs uh, typically and, and, and staying in the comfortable realm of user interfaces yeah. <laughs> and, and then uh, we are kind of missing out on, on the kind of design thinking yeah. with APIs. And I remember when we had these kind of discussions um, with you actually on, on API cycles back yeah. in the day. <laughs> and, and what the you guys, days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um, I just put the link in the chat, but I think that this is exactly kind of where uh, the whole API cycles method is trying to lead people mm -hmm. that they would think about this uh, kind of the feedback cycles, but also the different developer segments and, and not just the technical aspects of what happens mm -hmm. when, when you have different segments, but also what are they thinking and what are they seeing and doing um, and, and what are they trying to achieve. Yeah. But hey, any great questions or all kinds of questions? To Nadia. Okay. <laughs> Super, okay. You came up with such a great question that you want to repeat the question. So, uh, okay. So, where would a sole entrepreneur publish their API products and how? Okay. Already there was uh, great answers about uh, your, uh, about like the uh, entrepreneurs publishing their API. Um, in my opinion, like if you're if you have already made your service and it is like production wise use, then um, possibly have your APIs in a way that you have a sandbox like environment where your feature and uh, where everyone can actually try out free uh, all your all your APIs or all your functionality before they can actually um, they can actually commit to your service from uh, from API uh, from business perspective or making the decision to purchase your concept so the uh, so this sandbox API can be something that in a in a set of your environment and then having uh, API documentation and then having the guides onboarding guides trying to like amalgate three different services together to try out them. Uh, should be should be one way of like providing your providing your APIs for public use to the developers. Because um, like if you're because uh, if you're uh, providing with the curl examples to try out and they are simply opening uh, they are simply opening a console and then trying out those APIs API calls to see what sort of re re uh, responses they get. Then I guess like an inside environment in your uh, in your intranet, maybe in a Docker uh, maybe in a Docker component or something that you can uh, run the sandbox version of your API. But then again, I still feel that if you think about the marketplace perspective uh, of trying out your API, then the API uh, then the web um, the programmable web is a good option you can think about because it gives you an API profile. It allows you the SDKs that you can provide. It allows you to add libraries, code samples, and even articles to redirect you to use them. So maybe something on this, but that also, again, depends on what's, uh, what, am uh, what amount of resource or investment you are planning to use in order to, uh, in order to 
publish your APIs or giving access to your uh, customers to them. And then pretty much coming down from the developer segment. So, so like, who, where are they? Who are they? Where will they find you? And, mm-hmm. and, and one thing I, I kind of want to emphasize here is that it, the, the question is always, uh, do, should you like do SDK? Should you do just API documentation? You, you touched on this, but, <laughs> but the real question is, what are your developer customers? What do they expect to have and what... Well, uh kind of can you have resources to really maintain because i remember one of our early customers at osanga who who like they had early on when they had first published their apis they had had this sdk and even some community sdks and api documentation but then they just didn't have the resources to maintain them and it was really bad developer experience Uh, because the GitHub repo had kind of like these old SDKs and you could see that nobody had committed anything there for ages and and there were even some a bit rude answers <laughs> for, from the developers to the developers. Yeah, they will, they will never tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's so much more than just, you know, where is the documentation? It's also yeah. the whole life cycle of it. Yeah. Thank But you. Yeah. Thank you, um, Nadia. It was really good. And Alan, do you have a question here, or comment, or something? Something. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, API portals, developer portals out there. I mean, what what would you say is your your favorite developer portal, and why? And, and you can't say platform of trust, right? No, no, it's <laughs> a, a CMS running um if you if you think about if you think about the api portals or things i always try to follow uh, what stripe is doing because like they have now uh, they have now started to like productize their api so that the apis are no longer a uh, black box that you don't know what is happening over there and they are actually writing down contents In a, in a sense that both the business people, the people in between the two domain, like business and technology and hardcore developers can actually find their ways over there. And uh, previously, I think we have been discussing this during the early days of API Ops that we should start treating APIs as products which are actually core to your business model. So something they are actually doing that, yes, our products, our APIs, our products, they are the core in providing the features that we are offering to our customers. So yeah, in that sense, I feel like their documentation or the way they are, they show their onboarding or stuff like that. Um, Let me share Stripe's uh api uh striped apis api API documentation and they also have like this um the onboarding style which is kind of like the def uh the de facto the de not the de facto but like place uh the how the people are actually thinking that what it should be there when you are actually thinking about using stripe and something So here are the like the docs. They are API documentation, and then their developer documentation is a little bit different. So based on the based on their feature set or other thing, they have got like a lot of documents to show like how you are actually accepting the accepting the payments or something. And in this documentation, they are actually like showing um, consoles where you can actually try out them. So mm-hmm. from that perspective, I would say that places in your uh, so places where you are actually offering your APIs, there should be some way even to try out your APIs in there, irrespective mm-hmm. of whatever uh, whatever the backend uh, backend uh, uh, backend enterprise solution you are using. There can be even API portals from Microsoft Azure itself, and they and they might be using something totally different. But nevertheless. It should be a place, and maybe not the uh, maybe not this place as per se. But even if people are able to try out your uh, sample APIs via a terminal and something, that would be like really good for anyone. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Good. Yeah, yeah. Just 
Alan. If I if I sh share my screen quickly as well, yes. um, just just to look at that um, Stripe documentation. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I think it's coming yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It's also, you know, I mean, I, I love it as well. It, it, it's going to mm. be up there in like, you know, my, my uh, top three <laughs> uh, documentation uh, yeah. repositories. It, it, it's beautiful, but I just wanted to also point out that thing I was talking about here as well, like mm. a lot of developers, but they kind yeah. of like, yeah. they, they try and pull them out quickly and they, they take them out to a marketplace and they say, okay, yeah. you know, we can actually go there as well. And uh, and they, they have that experience for, um, you know, not a developer as the persona. And, and you can see it's a lot more, um, I'm just going to accept all cookies like I, I do. Uh, and then it's, it's exactly what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's like more that sort of, you know, marketplace, right? That the developer may or may not sort of dig, right? Maybe developers are a bit more comfortable, you know, just going through the documentation and saying, okay, you know, well, I can see very quickly. So it talks about having APIs that are quite easy to understand, right? So our refunds yeah. is the API. It's pretty clear, right? Uh, well, like, yeah, who's the refund? I, I want to add here, uh, actually, about like the refund, for example, that if you are a developer, you might not have any idea what the yeah. heck is a refund. <laughs> yes. and, but the point is, because I've had to explain so many of these concepts to so many developers over the years. Yeah. But what is lov lovely in Stripe is that they do try to explain mm -hmm. what the heck is a refund. I mean, they have yeah. these kind of like, you know, the business concepts to the developers and vice versa. And I think that that's the, the actual best thing. Like yeah. there's a lot of good things in here, but that's the actual best thing. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. And I also like the way that related guides, they are even mentioning it that here is the guide you should follow. So they are also thinking about onboarding and then explore it, exploring their APIs. Because if you just like pop into Stripe document and then, okay, what is refund? You don't know. So, yeah, but there's a related guide, refund. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's yes. somebody explaining that to me. So. Yeah. So I think that there there are so many layers of goodness in Stripe API, but yeah, there are yeah, also there are also some things that when you actually are a developer and you actually start using the API, then there are some things like we we did mm -hmm. a benchmark for another uh, payment API or yeah. financial service API that was our customer, and we did comparison against Stripe mm -hmm. API and a few others, and there were actually some hidden gotchas in in stripe api that you kind of like miss when you look at the awesomeness of it mm -hmm. at first glance and when you actually start trying it out there are a few things that you can get stuck on but the testing of it is really good because they do give, give you that fake uh, credit card number and uh, things like that and that's pretty nice but yeah. i have to just take really quickly i wrote it in the chat too but bonage uh on like bonage is uh or next most API that they bought mm. uh, is actually one of my like really favorites because it has a lot of the good stuff that Stripe has, but it also has this like sandbox where yeah. you, can, even if you are not a technical person and it's a very, very tricky subject because you are actually using phone calls and text messages and everything with API, which is yeah. not the, the necessarily the easiest thing to do and understand so they have this kind of playground and stuff there that you can try out stuff and and they have like they have even mastered the difficult thing of demoing and trying out the, the, the stuff where you actually do have to deal with real phone calls and text messages mm -hmm. while you are doing your api calls, and that's not <laughs> necessarily the easy thing to do yeah. so uh, i think that that is one of the the good things um, yeah. and we actually have that as an example in the Osang Academy course that we did with Platform of Trust Jarkko Moilanen but yeah. um, that's that's like a really great example. Yes and I think about the example that you bring they are also trying the way to uh, to experiment with the low code no code uh, technology. Yeah. It's they like are, yeah. now uh, a hype that anyone can come and then try your service or do some integration without having absolutely little or no knowledge about 
coding. So I guess like the platforms and the service provider or Stripe, they are gradually shifting into that experience, mm -hmm. that that uh, that other magnitude or that other orientation of providing great user experience and developer experience that uh, try our service, do implementation work, but you don't need to do any code. The solution yeah. is our our marketing people are using Zapier <laughs> and APIs all the time, and mm -hmm. you know they couldn't do that if there wouldn't be any like low yeah. code no code. And of course, it is still something that you really need to kind of understand how things actually work it's not still for everyone or honestly yeah. but it is for like it is possible to learn to deal yeah. with stuff and and gradually kind of do more difficult stuff yeah. and still it doesn't mean that you will ever become a coder but but you can do stuff that normally or it used to be that only developers could do so yeah. that's an yeah. interesting concept yes so, hey, but any other last minute questions for our speakers today? Anyone, anyone, now is your chance. Or forever hold your peace, at least until the next day, perhaps meet up. So you, if you would like to talk to uh, talk to me about more developer experience and developer resources, or even from design principles, please uh, reach me out in LinkedIn. It's my profile here, LinkedIn.com, Nazia Hassan. And then you can also to, uh, tag me in Twitter at Nazara the Cat. Uh, you can see that, yeah, I am a cat person. So I decided to make my Twitter name like that. But please feel free to uh, get connect and then send me a message and we will have more talks about it. And although I give you guys a demo about uh, our developer portal, which is based on Wachtel CMS, so you can always go there and take a look at what we are doing in terms of contents to improve, uh, to continuously improve developer experience in platform of trust over here. And also this is our uh, API documentation, which we are actually generating with a uh, API, API engine, uh, one service that we are using where you can put a uh, RAML, a RAML spec, and then this three column API, API uh, HTML documentation will be uh, generated. So, and on the beginning of 2021 in the January, we will be actually bringing the second develop a uh, second version of our developer portal. So possibly maybe I'll have another talking about my new learnings in there but yeah, yeah. And that would be a perfect talk for api days helsinki by the way just saying oh, okay. <laughs> so. i'm really scared because there, there is the place for the big sharks and now <laughs> yeah. hey hey we used to all be <laughs> in the <laughs> first first time speaker so hey uh but seriously we have next monday uh, Hypertrace and APIs and Compliance Observability. There's a link in chat. We have the next API Ops Meetup uh, coming hopefully in December because Christmas is canceled. So then we can have like API Ops Meetups, a lot of them. And then uh, there's uh, January, there's RecOps Days for regulative uh, industries and, and software development. And then in March, there's API Days Helsinki. Yeah. So be sure to type your way into speakerhood or sponsorship or or just plain attendees. Yeah. Good. Thank you, everyone. And it has been nice listening and talking to you. And the recording of this meetup will go to the API Ops Cycles um, uh, YouTube channel and in the API Ops.info blog and some kinds of social media sometime mm -hmm. after this. Thank you everyone. Have a nice night. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you too. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.